So actually, um, yeah, welcome. Uh, very nice to be here today in this whole place. <laughs> um, yeah, we are having uh, like a few weeks kind of workshop, laboratory, however we are going to call this. Um, mostly the topic uh, about places of uncertainty is our topic, and most people here are maybe half as our participants. And um, like today, more we wanted to uh, open up the public because today we are going to talk a little bit about photography, um, maybe contextualizing photography as well. Maybe it will help us, like obviously, uh, like contribute to the workshop to reflect a little bit what we are doing or why we are doing things. And uh, tomorrow we have a lecture um, with Maria Ruzzo. Ruzzo. She will uh, present some of her works, which is actually very nice to our topic. And yeah, um, today sorry for to make it public uh, because I think it's kind of interesting what we. Ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's kind of interesting, um, maybe for other people as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, no more work like this. Uh, yeah, feel free. Yeah, feel free to interrupt. Yeah, I think so. Yeah? yeah. I would, would say. Wouldn't be bad. Wouldn't be bad. Feel free yeah. to interrupt if you. If it wouldn't be bad. <laughs> yeah, so for those who are not in the workshop, like our workshop is mostly, uh, it's about the Kishino city and uh, the first year it was about the periphery from all point of, from all kind of perspectives, like it could be like geographical, it could be like space uh, term and could be also like a mental thing or something else. Today we are speaking about, this year we are speaking about like places of uncertainty, also from the different terms. Like we started from the fact that we have a lot of places in Kishinev that has an uncertain future and also an uncertain present, but very, so at some point very certain past, but only at some part of the population somehow. Uh, we choose in the workshop to talk mostly about the visual representation because both of us are coming from the photography industry mostly and today I wanted to speak mostly about the photography and uh, visual narrative and where it came from and everything I would talk today would be more or less linked and connected with the uh, photojournalism or documentary photography because this is my background and uh, I would like to talk mostly about the how we see things and why we see them as they are at least I would try to and uh, where it all came from um, and I would like to start from this slide and I would like to ask you a question if you know all of these three photos First is the first photo ever taken. Yeah. Last two, I don't know. And this, someone else? First baby pick and first. First baby pick. <laughs> 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 and the first dog pick. <laughs> and dog toes pick. Yeah. So, actually, the first photo is what it called to be official first photo I ever take, which never was the first official photo I ever take, but was first registered photo because uh, Nisifor Nieps and uh, together with Dagger they invented this process a long time ago, but it was actually discovered a long time ago by the, the French guy Baudier, who actually was uh, really like a, how, how do you call it? Uh, the guy, the inventor, who had no money, and those guys were like in the in entertainment industry, and they actually worked a lot with the camera obscura effect, which was known much before, before the invention of photography. And at some point, they wanted to register the light somehow to make more profit out of it. And the French government actually took his 
patent as the heritage of France and the gift of France towards all the universe, which were our Earth in those days. The Russell Kirch is a <coughs> guy who actually made the first digital picture, but it's not a photograph. If you Google the first uh, digital photograph, there will be another guy from uh, Kodak Company who actually tried to uh, impress the Kodak Company that his picture, like his first digital apparatus, which were like writing it on the magnet cassette, like an audio cassette. But they said, like, uh, who would ever watch on the picture in the screen? Yeah, what's the point of it? And then uh, the guy on the right, Kevin Sistrom, who is the founder of the Instagram, uploaded this first picture. It's not the first picture uploaded to the internet, but the Instagram changed everything about what are the pictures in the internet. La la la, la 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 la, looking for a mouse. Yeah, yeah, no. Is there someone on the... Take another one. This is yeah. Yeah. First portrait and the selfie. Yeah. And the next one. Can someone please stay there like constantly? But yeah. But the first selfie that are more or less uh, similar to our times was taken like in 1920. First portrait was in the 19th century. But the first mentioning of the selfie was actually because of that guy in the Oxford Dictionary. Can you do this next one? Of course, from the side, it wasn't so <laughs> picturesque as it was from the selfie, as every selfie. <laughs> Can you do the next one, please? Yeah. This is another thing that uh, we quite used to do, you know, to set the cat pictures and all this other stuff. But actually, it was really popular to do that in the 19th century to send the cat pictures to people, of course not by internet, but other means of communication, which was the postal services. Uh, but where I want to start, like from talking about like uh, the delivering the information, is about this guy, who was the abolitionist from the southern states, from Africa, oh, uh, sorry, America. And uh, he actually fled away from the southern states to... I actually don't remember the state where he fled from. But he was an activist and he was a fighter for the uh, slave rights. And he used the camera as a tool without being a photographer. He actually believed in photography as a tool that ex destroys all the limits between the classes. And he was saying that... Uh, the photography actually is the a privileged tool that clears the privilege between the slaves and the privileged society somehow because in the matter of the those days minutes of hours you can do and you can witness yourself and you can bring yourself the proudness of being representative and to be looked he also used the photography each time, because he was a public figure, each time he was presented to a photographer to take a picture, he always started to try to look into the camera to give the, this look into the spect spectator's eyes. Because before, the African-American population was uh, represented as uh, dumb people with a narrow forehead, and so on, and with the exaggerated lips and the big eyes, and mostly black face those days. Can you? Yeah, it was. The Negro is pictured with the features distorted, lips exaggerated, forehead low and depressed, and the whole countenance made to harmonize with the popular idea of Negro ignorance, degradation, and imbecility. Yeah, so. That's uh, what he believed in, and he wrote actually a lot of things about photography those days, because he saw 
photography and let's not forget that in the 19th century photography was a really high-end tool uh, to deliver information which was not known before but like if we go uh, closer to my topic and uh, to the topic of photojournalism the first ever so-called registered officially registered uh, case of the photojournalism was the case of Roger Fenton and the Crimean War uh, Crimean War was quite unpopular during the Crimean War uh, in the UK so the UK government decided to send the photographer to Crimea to actually raise awareness that uh, it is sh we should actually invest money into the, the foreign affairs somehow and he went there and this photograph were published first describing the Crimean War but there is actually one small thing that there is two different photographs which is this and the, can you put the previous one? not previous one previous. and this the one has the cannonballs on the road and another one has no and there was like a, a long time like dilemma which pictures was the first yeah this one or this one uh, a lot of people started to manipulate about the fact that uh, he actually put those cannonballs and everything else but at the end it's not proved all the diaries that were found, that when he wrote to his wife, that I took two great pictures during the days, never were speaking about the fact which kind of pictures and what he did to take those pictures. But during the years, I think like maybe the last five years or something, the uh, one guy actually paid attention to the rocks and the movement of the rocks, if you can see here, some of the rocks. Here are in the same position and the previous picture there on the top. So that's why they decided to this picture is actually was the first one. And the first one was the second one. But nevertheless they choose this picture to show the Crimean War those days. Can you go further? Yeah. Um, those days uh, the picture photographing process was quite long by time because the taking a picture was like from 10 to 1 minute so people should be still and all the pictures that he took actually was like this kind of posing pictures where people it's not a moment that he took it's just uh, posing can you uh -huh. yeah and this is like the all the equipment that he should have cared with himself <laughs> those days yeah. Also, including the man. It's not him. It's an assistant. Yeah. Can you move to the next one? But one of the things that I want to like pay attention more during this speech of mine is Jacob Lees. He was one of the first uh, photographers who was actually not a photographer. He was an activist. He was a writer. He was a sociologist anthropologist and uh, he saw that there is a big problem in uh, Manhattan with um, immigrants and the conditions of their lives so he documented that and he used photography as a tool of documentation and promoting the idea of advocacy of those people who live in a miserable condition so uh, he didn't run for the shots he didn't run for the decisive moment, he didn't run for the spectacular composition or something else, or, or light. He actually tried to picture those people in most spectacular way to make an influence on the spectator who will read the newspapers and so on. And actually after his work, he, he did a significant work which was not only taking those pictures, but writing the text, speaking with the people, documenting everything, and then presenting it also in the city hall in Manhattan those days. Yeah. 
the next one. And the second guy is Louis Heine, who lived a bit, uh, who was born a bit uh, later. And uh, he was also the same kind of guy as uh, Jacob Rees. But uh, his most influential work was about the child labor, and he actually, because of his work, uh, he, he changed, I mean, because of his work, there was change of legislation in the United States, and the child was not allowed to work. Because before, you could, you could see the child at any factory working like in a really tough jobs in the, in the mines, in the coal mines. Yeah, I can show more pictures. Yeah, one more. Yeah. So you, he used that tool, but he never photographed, as per se. He documented, as well as you document something by writing, or scanning, or whatever else, or making analytics. Can you, yeah, I mean, you can do this. The another thing of uh, another case that I would like to present about the documenting, but in the frame of the collaboration, because I'm not sure, but maybe because of the, all those uh, positive examples of collaborating with Jacob Rees, Louis Hyde, and all other photographers who were in the States. During the Great Depression, the uh, uh, sort of Ministry of Agriculture from the States, I forgot the name, they actually hired the photographer Dorothy Lange, Lang, Lange, Lang, uh, to document the Great Depression and to go in the field and photograph, 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 photograph everything that was there. And that actually helped a lot to bring awareness towards what happened those days and how we could measure that. Yeah. That was about the uh, civil activism, like uh, photograph, visual activism in those days. But may towards I, the... Yeah. May I uh, just like a, as a side note uh, with Louis Hein, um, from this activistic uh, perspective, um, he was he, uh, also maybe like in the direction of authorship uh, as a topic. Um, he would kind of also find this child labor not only as a kind of documentary of it, but also uh, he would like put the pictures on on cupboards and like, you know, like a sandwich man would walk in the streets with his own pictures to demonstrate against child labor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was really, actually, um, yeah, regarding this custom we had yeah. at the kitchen table yesterday, it's really uh, one of my uh, great idols if you think about yeah. Um, like going from beginning to end. Beginning would mean actually, for example, to get into also these industrial buildings. He would dress up as a priest or a monk, so he could hide all the photography equipment underneath to, enter, <laughs> to then document the child labor, to then print them out, to then go on the street to kind yeah. of protest against it. So he actually used photography not just to get those shots, but actually to deliver them to the people, and he had all the plan towards it. Uh, with the times when photography became much more popular, and the uh, cameras became really compact, when the, with the invention of 35mm camera, the, uh, such photographers in Henri Cartier-Bresson and all others moved from the large format or brownie cameras or medium format photography to 35mm and Leica's. And that's when the moment when, from my point of view, like the view of photography kind of being, have been distorted a lot, because nevertheless of the input and the heritage that Henri Cartier-Bresson gave, and second one, Alex Webb and Steve McCurry gave, during those days, called like golden years of photojournalism and so on, but at the end it was the golden year of seeking a perfect shot and exoticizing of the reality at some point. And some of those photographers actually have been caught with the manipulation of the reality that they pretended to give really true. Can you do this next one? In the case of Steve McCary when he was caught with this shot, 
which was delivered to the print shop for the exhibition. And the next one, and right after that, that shot was discovered, people start, no, 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 please, go back. Yeah. Uh, people start to find more and more and more cases where like original bottom, the edited top. And right after that, the Steve McCurry, who promoted himself as a, a pearl of photojournalism and everything else, doing a lot of expensive uh, photo workshops all over the world for photojournalists and documentary photographers. He claimed that he, after this debunks, that he is not a photojournalist, he is a visual uh, storyteller. Which is kind of, yeah. let's go. Um, but in the same time, like in those years, in the golden year, like in pre-golden year, I would say, there was another guy whose name is Eugene Smith, which kind of enters in this, um, mm, I would say, like a manual for the photojournalists and so on, because he was the one of the first guys who actually uh, proved that you can reach some kind of the awareness by uh, investing your time to your protagonist and then investing your time to the edit of what is what will what should will be after that he was so invested in what he was doing that when he was uh, assigned to do this uh, reportage about the country doctors in the United States because after the World War, the Second World War, there was not enough country doctors in the United States. So he went to the rural area where this guy was serving like around 10, around 10 of the uh, villages and uh, he was photographing him. But he was uh, actually not photographing him from the very beginning. Like the first week he was just walking with the so-called AD camera, which is like a typical camera but without the film. So he was just like pretending to take pictures to be, uh, to make people more like acquainted with the, his process and what he do, his movements and so on. And like this photograph was like done like, like many days after he came to the village and he was actually hidden in the bushes somewhere, waiting for him somewhere. Can you do like a few more, like five seconds and so on? So uh, he actually well known for the sequencing and the working with the sequencing. Like in the contrary with uh, Henrik and Tiberson, which was still known only for the fact that he is waiting for the decisive moment that depicts reality in some form. And yeah, and this is actually the one of the things that gets to the old manual for the, for the journalist, like how you can actually raise awareness by uh, storytelling uh, yeah, in, the, in the magazine. He also, uh, like, his work is um, quite known for the Minamata project. Maybe some of you saw this horrible movie about Minamata with Johnny Depp. Uh, because uh, like, he documented this um, the um, how do you call it in English uh, the consequences of the one of the uh, the mercury in uh, Japan to raise awareness again uh, against the consequences of that uh, production the dangerous production there yeah, yeah. And this is one of his phrases that he says that. Photography is a small voice at best, but sometimes, just sometimes, one photograph or a group of them can lure our sense into awareness. Much depends upon the viewer, and some photographs can summon enough emotion to be a catalyst to thought. Yeah. And now I want to break a bit and show like a slide. Yeah, show a slide. <laughs> So this is how the, our eyes, or like not our eyes, how our retina registers the information. So everything that we actually see goes from this phase to ascending to our brain, uh, where our 
the information from our retina is actually processed to kind of give us the what we call the objective information. But it all depends also about the process in our brains and how we perceive it. Yeah. Can you? <laughs> For instance, uh, I don't know. Ah, okay. No, no, can you go back? For instance, visual information is uh, uh, a very cool thing to influence the your people. Like uh, Mao Zedong used this picture to actually show that he's still alive before the Cultural Revolution. Because before the, before the Cultural Revolution, he was kind of in, in a decline and he had a lot of opposition those days. But he decided to show that I'm still alive. And during the Maoist time, like early Maoist time, he had the cult of the swimming. So he called a photographer to shoot him in the river. And then they published it in the newspaper, showing the sign, and showing the uh, proof that he's still alive and he actually can do things. And if all other world actually laugh about it and make a lot of fun about it for the Chinese population, Chinese people, for the younger generation, that was a call to follow the leader after that, whatever he said. Can you do another one? Also, we, I showed a slide about the uh, Eugene Smith. In the middle of 20th century, during the Cuba, after the Cuban crisis, where the Fidel Castro were in power, the communist ideas were quite popular in the South America. So, the United States tried to promote the ideas of the freedom, democracy, blah, 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 and all that stuff. And they actually tried to invest a lot in those countries. And the Life magazine uh, chief editor uh, was actually quite into it. So they hired a quite well-known photographer whose name is Gordon Parks to go to Rio de Janeiro and shoot uh, something about uh, the life of the one man and uh, how he goes, how he goes by and everything. Of course it was shot in the slums. Uh, Gordon Parks actually did the series not about the poverty but about the guy the child of Fabio, and he did a story about him. But of course he had no power among two of the edits. So that was the edit about it. So they really tried to show that there is a poverty in Rio de Janeiro, just showing the story about one small guy. Like putting that kind of title, showing the crying girl next to the tired father, then showing the next spread with the, another crying girl, view of the slums with a, a, a recognizable image like the statue of Jesus and the brother of the Flavio walking next by then showing the daily routine of the guy and how he cares about, about take care of his siblings and then showing the symbolic pictures of him lying down and the picture from the funeral of his neighbor saying that the Flavio has suffering from asthma and everything else and he could die. The story had a really nice ending because then uh, there were after the publishing the guy, the Flavio was invited to the United States, they actually treated his asthma, everything was nice, they put also cover the cover of the Life magazine with him very happy, in color, after America and so on. Right after that, like several weeks after that, can you... Yeah. The... Yeah, back. Cruzeiro magazine, which is sort of like a sister magazine of Life magazine in Brazil, which is like a general interest magazine, which is also based on the mostly targeting their audience through the pictures, did the same story, just showing that the uh, Gordon Parks or Life magazine 
used one specific family to describe and depict all the Brazilian. So they actually send the photographer, the Henry Balot, send them him to the uh, New York to do kind of the same stuff, and he actually reproduced the same stuff using the same, not using the, uh, I mean, using the real circumstances of the poverty and so on, just depicting the same thing. And then, yeah, the title says like, yeah, new record record of America misery. Which after that like kind of raised a lot of questions of like some things were posed because in the last picture because of the blurness of the screen you can see but the uh, this uh, boy is uh, covered with the cowcrouchers and someone was saying that some the photographer put the cowcrouchers and then uh, other people went back to uh, yeah that's better <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you put the previous one, please? And then um, the Brazilian photographers that tried to actually go to the Flavius house and see if this light is actually the light of the dawn, because the caption says that Flavio wakes up at the dawn, but then they were saying that actually you don't have this kind of light at the dawn, and it was shot at the noon, but the caption is kind of misleading towards what was happening at all. Can you, yeah. This is more like about the manipulation of you can use the visual language and what you can do with that and about uh, objectivity, if it exists or not. Can you do this next one? Yeah. So by one of the research from MIT, the visual information is more or less perceived by, like in this time frame, 0 or 13 seconds. So if I give you like this slide, the next one, and you press the play, like our like, uh, space bar, yeah? No, <laughs> no. not like that. Yeah? It's very fast, but you kind of see what's happening there, what is happening there. You can see and you can divide and you can group the pictures and you can group some kind of uh, subjects and the situation that are happening there. Yeah? Can you put the next one? While well, reading this one takes longer time, not to comprehend what is written there, but just to read there and to understand the words. It takes much longer time. So the visual information is much more powerful towards the viewer. Yeah. Have you read that, what was written, no? Yeah, yeah the photo a photograph is not only an image, as a painting, as an image, and, in, and interpretation of the real, it is also a trace, something directly stenciled of the real, like a footprint or a death mask. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, do you know this image? Yeah? It's a Grand Central Station in New York, but do you know what is special about this image? There is no light anymore. There is no light anymore. So this picture, like, it couldn't be done anymore. It just one picture, maybe there was more, but this is one of the most uh, famous. Because after the 30s, there was a skyscraper built right after it. So this is a document, actually. Without maybe intention or something, this light became a document that some time ago there was no skyscraper and about also the uh, the uh, um, high-speed development in the New York and Manhattan as well. Can you do the second one? Also, like as a Vivian Meyer, who never was a professional photographer, a photojournalist or something like that, she was just discovered, like in zeros, with a hundred thousand of the negatives in her archive, being and uh, working as a simple nun in New York. Can you do the second one? Or, you maybe you know this, it's Zaharia Kushnir, who was found in the north of Moldova in Roshietich? Yeah, in Roshietich village. Living around 2,000 negatives about the uh, life of the neighboring villages at the north of Moldova during the times when the 
uh, popular photography, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, vernacular photography was not so popular in Moldova because it came later, like in the 70s, where there was a lot of zenits and all those like 35 millimeter cameras that were quite affordable for the people. But during the 50s, it was kind of, you couldn't find a lot of pictures that are not made by the uh, official photographers of the institutions, like Kolhos or Ministry or something else. So he did that. Can you explain more? But <coughs> the same time, do you know this picture? Yeah, maybe. It's, I mean, it's written there. So it's world press photo of the year 2018. Uh, these pictures were done during the uh, clashes uh, in uh, Venezuela, and it was chosen as a photo of the year those days. What do you think about it? If you have thoughts. Mm -hmm. How much does it tell you about Venezuela? Or the injustice in Venezuela? It reminds me of Frasier. Cool. <laughs> like a pop culture reference. Yeah. Then? Because it shows that in Venezuela people are so desperate that they're going to go to that extreme means for something, so that means people are very tired. But do you think he's desperate and he went to the fire? He was just caught by fire? Yeah, but, by he, yeah, but I think because he was wearing a gas mask as well, and I think he, but he knew the risks of going... But that's not a fire mask. <laughs> yeah, but he, knew, but he knew the risks of going maybe at a protest or even speaking up. Okay. Uh, can you show the another one, please? Another side. Ah, uh, that's a bullshit stuff. Yeah. Sometimes when the photojournalists uh, do some work, they actually run for the shots and they run for the icons. Something that were depicted also by Enrico Tepreson or other thinkers about photography, not photographers, it should be an iconic image that depicts something and actually that's something that you can use to raise awareness about. Something that Eugene Smith spoke about, but Eugene Smith never ran for the one photograph or something. This is the case of uh, Fabiana, I forgot her surname. It's a picture made during the, after the earthquake in Haiti. A uh, picture in Fabiana who was killed by police because of the looting thing. And this picture were done by one of the... Yes. These guys. Yeah. And you can do the next one. Yeah. So you can see the different faces of uh, Fabiana being there. This case also actually raised a lot of questions towards the photojournalist community, what we do and why we do that, because of the aesthetics of death, aesthetics of misery, aesthetics of whatever uncomfortable to see and whatever, like being uncomfortable to see that, being at Manhattan or any other uh, city center, you look at the pictures, you close the newspaper, you drink your cappuccino or ice latte and you go to your comfy work uh, and unfortunately photographers do that all the time and beside the fact that they really think that they work and change something the funny thing that things that change something are going after these uh, events the photographers that go after the news that work with the local population that try to document what was happening there. Yeah, but can you change the next thing? Yeah. Do you know something about this picture? Maybe someone knows. Do you remember the Paris attack events? In 2015, I guess. Yeah? 16. 15? Okay. 
This uh, photo, the series of photographs, you can put the next one. Yeah, the series of photographs were taken by the Spanish photographer. Um, it's just a vernacular photography of the people, who, victims of the Paris attack. So they were just put on the ground by the people who came to mourn with the flowers, with the photographs and so on. And that happens that it happens that there was a rain those days and all those photographs were covered by the raindrops. And this Spanish photographer who were working for the EP, he instead of photographing the morning people, which is a trope and a, quite a huge cliche, he actually took pictures of those portraits. And he won like a second or third place in the portrait category in the World Press Photo. But for some reason, uh, not for some reason, but the specific reason of the fact that there was a third party involved, uh, third party authorship uh, involved, AP uh, withdraw the pictures from the uh, World Press Forum. Can you do the second one? Which was quite uh, aggressively, uh, had a lot of aggression from the uh, photo community because it was one of the things that actually brought some new wave and new feelings towards the photojournalism, especially in the frame of World Press Photo, which is... Can you do the second one? Have you, have you read? Yeah. 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 Because uh, like this is a photograph uh, which is... Uh, were done by a uh, simple Iraqi guy it was a project that supposed for like 10 or 20 people to go to uh, from the Iraqi citizen from Baghdad they were giving these disposable cameras to document their life it was the project I guess in 2004 so a couple of years two years or three years one year I guess after the uh, withdrawal of uh, Saddam Hussein government and Malala and um, one of the curators of that project was uh, Fred Richin, who was one of the theoretician of photography, and he was working, he has a, a, a experience of working like 20 years or something as a photo editor, and he saw a lot of pictures from the war, and he was saying to me, like, this picture actually changed my attitude and my uh, feelings towards the Iraqi people, because this photograph gave me much more feeling than any other picture made during the war by a professional photographer because this guy went to make I mean not this guy this is a woman, this guy is making a teeth his tooth and he was in the age when he was making was going quite often to the dentist office and how often do we think about those people, those people from other areas what are the links between us? Yeah? Can you do that? Yeah, this is uh, what he wrote. These pictures are a result of that experiment. They are glimpses from the inside. Ten people were given cameras in April and May. They were told this is an opportunity to show the American public what you want to see. What you, what you want them to see. No one has found weapons of mass destruction, but in these pictures taken from the ten rolls of film, there may be glimmers of another, more formidable weapon, understanding. Yeah, can I do another one? Talking about the war. Of course, there was... There is a lot of pictures, iconic pictures, that describe the war, and sometimes they actually... Uh, accidentally, they change how things are going in the history. Like this picture of Nikut, which uh, had a lot of uh, uh, feedback in the United States. Can you do the second one? Yeah. Unfortunately, we changed the um, laptops and I cannot show you the slides. This is supposed to be a slide of World Press Photo of the Year. Uh, where I just want to show like what how uh, conflict photography were chosen as World Press Photo of the Year for 30 or 20 times, showing the same tropes. Men with a gun, men, women mourning, women crying, women opposing the men with a gun, 
women mourning, women holding uh, a son or a child, a, a small child, son or daughter, and so on. One of the latest one was the uh, the Muslim women holding uh, that son, like an um, adult one, which was like really photographed in the form of like a Madonna which raises a big question, why do you choose the photo of the year, the picture that actually draw from the Christian mythology and you through the Christian mythology you want to describe the uh, conflict in an Islamic country. Yeah, we can hear this one a bit. Can you put the space bar? Yeah, space bar. Space bar. And the sound? Oh, it's VGA. Can you do from the beginning, please? Botticelli's Venus and Mars used to be a unique image, which was only possible to see no, leave it in like the this. room where it was actually hanging. Now his image, or a detail of it, or the image of any other painting he has reproduced, can be seen in a million different places at the same time. As you look at them now, on your screen, your wallpaper is round. Your window is opposite. Your carpet is below. At this same moment, they are on many other screens, surrounded by different objects, different colors, different sounds. You are seeing them in the context of your own life. They are surrounded not by gilt frames, but by the familiarity of the room you are in and the people around you. Once all these paintings belong to their own place, some were all to pieces in churches. Originally, paintings were an integral part of the building for which they were designed. Sometimes, when you go into a Renaissance church or chapel, you have the feeling that the images on the wall are records of the building's interior life. Together, they make up the building's memory. So much are they part of the life and the individuality of the building. Everything around the image is part of its meaning. Its uniqueness is part of the uniqueness of the single place where it is. Everything around it confirms and consolidates its meaning.
It, it's it was just a piece. It was a piece from the uh, John Berger, he was also the theoretician of photography and visual arts, mostly about photography, a series called uh, The Ways of Seeing, where he talked about the photography and the paintings. Yeah? Why I showed these pictures? Because he talked about the icon and the iconic pictures, which had always <coughs> its own context, and when you see them right now, it's out of the context. And when you use also this kind of context that were like to this linked to the specific place like Christian icons and Christian uh, narratives, and you use those styles and translate it to the other countries and take and de depict some kind of reality through those styles, show it like frame it through those styles and then show it to the same place, it kind of out of the context you are delivered a picture which is misleading to you because you've never been there, you never saw. For instance, Thomas Dvorak, uh, he was working as a photographer in, uh, during the Afghan war. He did a lot of coverage as well. But uh, what he's known mostly is about is a, this work about the Taliban's portraits. It's actually not his pictures. It's a reproduction of the pictures that he found in the photo labs in Afghanistan. During the Taliban time, the photography was forbidden by the Sharia law, but the Taliban had to have the documents, passport, like ID pictures. So some labs were working. But beyond the curtain, beside the curtain, there was another lab which were hidden where Taliban actually would like to have a pictures of them, colored together with the friends with a gun or something else, a lot of objects. Yeah, uh, can you see? Oh no, there is a slide. So let's, can you go back? Yeah, there's supposed to be slide in two notes and you transform it to the pay point. But you can just check it because it's really amazing series. It shows you actually another perspective of the people uh, during the war because showing only the conflict and the fighting process, actually the fighting process is the same everywhere and you never can see the fight per se, because otherwise, I mean, you cannot shoot during the war, during the battle, during the combat. All the pictures that are done, they're done in between, or they're done as posing or something. But this actually shows you what happened, and more contextual information about what these people are. Maybe you cannot verbalize it, but you cannot kind of drag a feeling out of it. Can you put the next one? Yeah. Another example of how to show the conflict, for instance, is uh, uh, Richard Moss. Uh, there is a different opinion about his work. He uh, shot in the Congo, Republic of Congo, uh, which has a long history of the conflict. And uh, he actually used the Kodak Aerochrom uh, film uh, to photograph that conflict. Kodak Aerochrom film was used mostly to uh, uh, discover where there is uh, uh, rivers uh, in the um, uh, jungle areas or that is, um, areas where you can see a lot of the uh, trees and everything. And he used it to depict this conflict somehow. Can you put the next one? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Translating the green to the pink, he kind of tried to show the fact that, for, for, uh, at least for me, it's a fact of alienating the country as far that it could be uh, percepted as some like other planet or something. Because of we know that trees should be green, the grass should be green, but at the same time we see that in some that this is red also symbolizing the blood and blah 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 which is too cheap but kind of alienating those people and you kind of have a perception that it is happening in another planet which is actually happening which is actually the station that is for us from our perspective because the conflict in Congo we never read about it or we read something like few excerpts about it like I'm generalizing and saying can you do something more? Martha Rosler uh, she's not a photographer she's an artist from the United States 
She has this amazing project about uh, Vietnam War at Home, where she she was actually also a visual activist who were like uh, fighting again, fighting, yeah, um, advocating against the Vietnam War. So she was doing these collages uh, where she just um, combined the images from the war with the magazine about the suburban areas in the United States that were quite so so spreading during the, those years. Can you do the next one? Also, Martha Rosler did this thing when the Afghan war came in 2001. Exposing this thing, also she tried to, like, go, uh, go into the war, like, go Amer America goes to the war, and she exposed these um, huge pictures of, with collages of the American people in the war, in the uh, commercial galleries, like malls and everything. Can you do the next one? Yeah, Jennifer Carradine actually, without trying to speak about war, but without being in the war, just trying to speak with the veterans and understand what kind of problems they have going back home. So she worked a lot with the PTSD disorder and worked with the veterans, documenting their experience and not their reality, just posing the pictures as they are, as you can see here. Can you do the next one? Another thing, when the picture can be iconic, but never be taken by the professional photographer. It's a picture of the, uh, one of the torturers from the uh, Abu Kharib prison in Iraq. When they uh, just make a picture for the fun. When the United States soldiers were just so into the process that they actually they forgot what are the norms or anything. They, and at some point they were just taking selfies, with the people that were tortured and everything. One of the good and positive examples that I would like to talk about from World Press Photo is this photo of 2014, which was chosen as a World Press Photo of the Year. Do you know, someone of you know something about this photo? No? E this photo is about the refugees, and it was done like one or two years before the big refugee crisis. So John Steinmeier actually followed uh, refugees with the Africa and their way and so on. But what actually uh, made the connection for me in this photograph is maybe the same thing that uh, you have. Because what people do in this photograph, before sailing to the Europe, they actually try to catch the connection to call their families, wives, I don't know, friends and everything that I'm at the shore and soon I will be in Europe, maybe. You know? uh, another thing that also like uh, depicts the documentation of the refugee crisis that was like at the end of 2016 done, when uh, everything was kind of calm and the news uh, euphoria went down and not many uh, media, international media outlets were speaking about it. The same Richard Moses that did the project in, in, in Congo, he used another invisible spectrum to document those people, the refugee people in the refugee camps. Because the refugee camps, if you go to the Europe, uh, you would see that like, those people quite kind of invisible, so he kind of tried to emphasize that feeling by showing them in the night, but shooting them in the night through the invisible, with the camera that registered the invisible spectrum. This is another great example that I really like. James Reynolds did uh, pictures about the uh, death sentence, yeah, the people who were condemned in death sentence, but he never took a picture of the one person. In the uh, United States, you have this like a last meal wish, so he just took the pictures of the last meal of the people, and he asked, why this? One guy asked the cherry, because he would like, he wanted to have a cherry tree on his grave to grow up. Another guy who just took like a lot of sodas, the Coca Cola, because he thought that it will make his body explode, so everything will fill the 
uh, sting, you know, this sting. <laughs> but actually, like, yeah, it's like sort of another perspective without showing the face of the people because if you see the person's face and you see like he's like had a had death sentence, you kind of know your reaction already. But this gives you another perspective to how people think, think and so on. Can you do another one? Yeah. Uh, like my Michael Christopher Christopher Brown, who is also magna photographer right now, he did a lot of pictures by with the phone, and not the phone that we have today, but the phone that had really shitty quality those days, like iPhone 4 or something. And he actually shoot a lot of pictures using only the phone during the Arab Spring and uh, also Congo conflict and so on. Can you do another one? Yeah. So, this all, like, uh, I want to conclude to one thing that, um, I mean, you can read that, but uh, I can say that visual language photography appeared not so long time ago and it have been democratized quite recently for all of us. Because with the digitalization, the visual language and understanding of the visual things became quite obvious for us and we are like more or less literate on how to use that. But we are not always aware about the styles. Because if we want to write an SMS to your friend, we do write in one style. If we want to write a poem, we use a completely different style. If we want to write uh, cherere, we do use another style, which is not that obvious these days with the photography. Yeah? Can you? Yeah? So, I mean, this can be perceived as uh, writings. I mean, it, it is a writing, but it's not a poem. Yeah, well, but this is sort of the message. So we always, when we look at the photography or say any visual message, we should think like, what sort of style it is, by whom it was produced, is this, and how it can be uh, percepted, in which way it could be percepted. Can you do that? Yeah, it's also like writing for Fred Richin. Just as text messages and Twitter feeds, while vastly popular and at times revelatory do not have anywhere near the same range and shading as writing, nor do they reference, for the most part, the same vocabulary. Can you do the next one? Because in the visual language you can use actually anything and you can take the photography out of the form of the, those uh, uh, frame uh, context in the museum on the wall. The GR, for instance, uses his uh, photography as a street art working with the communities mostly. This is the uh, Mexican-American border, Mexican-United States border, where he took pictures of the local people and used them as installation, working together with the uh, community. Can you do the second one? Yeah, so he actually did this like a, a lunch, huge lunch table, which is also, he used a photograph of the eye of the uh, someone from the village. Can you do the next one? He also worked a lot with the, in at some point with the prisoners when he actually glued the prisoner photographs on the huge ceiling, like on, on, on the rooftop, where actually if you take his app, download the app of GR, you can actually scan those people and see and hear their stories and he kind of made those people visible out for others who are out of the penitentiary system. He also worked a lot and still works with the, in the favelas in Brasilia because of the uh, drug wars and the fear people uh, used to be to hide themselves from the society and uh, nevertheless the fact that they are actually like more talkative and they like to communicate people do hide themselves and he with his work he tried to uh, work with the community to work together to create those kind of pictures and to put the pictures of the regular people regular, 
people in the streets. You can do another one. So and he also did like this kind of thing, which is like a favela landscape, uh, just printing the gaze of the people, in the villagers from there. Yeah, can you do the next one? Yeah, yeah, next one. Yeah, next one. Yeah, the first one. Yeah, next one. Yeah. You can use, uh, like in the case of Michael Wolf, who actually used the Google Maps, Google Street, to do a photography, to do a street photography. Unfortunately, it's another case that we turn. Uh, we switch the files so there is no slideshow but you can know the Michael Wolf and his series of uh, unfortunate events and you can take a look after this there is another thing when you can actually use the documentary and also uh, collaborate with your protagonists like in this series by Boris Mikhailov who sometimes is criticized for the uh, m not manipulation, like uh, over, uh, like uh, like using his protagonist to show the specific image. He actually uh, worked with the uh, homeless people in Kharkiv to show this, like sort of, uh, how do you say, metaphorical way of living on the branch of society when the Soviet uh, Empire collapsed. Because before that, he also worked on the different terms of how Soviet uh, empire actually influenced society and the vision, and in how it was impairing the vision of the people. Also, can you do? So most of the pictures are staged. It was collaboration with the people. He was talking with them. He was like asking, "How would you like to be in the picture?" Sometimes he was uh, asking them to be in a certain way, and he was always done, always. Uh, uh, open about. Another thing of the, sp can we go back? Spontaneous thing, like Alexander Chekminov also, uh, Chekminov? Yeah, Chekminov, sorry. Uh, he was documenting the passportization, I mean he was not documenting, he actually had a job to take uh, ID passport of the uh, pensioners who couldn't move from their bed. So he came there and he, beside those photographs, he actually was hired to make uh, standard ID photographs, black and white, but he took the photograph with the surroundings, what was happening in those years, so it's sort of documentation which was intended to be just as a regular uh, ID passportization of the country. Later he uh, issued the book which is called the Passportization, Ukrainian Passportization. Yeah. Uh, another thing about like uh, how do you put yourself into the subject and how do you try to describe it? Diana Arbus was one of the first person, not one of them, she was the first person to actually publish the pictures about the transgender community. It was, I think, in 60 something, 60 or 58. But nevertheless, she was actually really criticized by the later community of transgender population from the uh, United States, uh, which was the can you read the second one? Which were the second uh, generation of them, who were in most of the cases friends of the non Golden, who actually also documented the transgender uh, community, but without showing them as transgender without paying attention to the fact that they are transgender. She was just a friend of them. She was just hanging around and sometimes taking the pictures, not of the subjects, but of their friends. Yeah. And all the work, she's never mentioning it as pictures of the transgender people trying to judge or overlook their behavior or something. She was just part of it. Yeah. which is lately um, to actually publish this series, this specific series was published as the ballot of the sexual dependence. Yeah, that's all. No, go back. That's horrible <laughs> pictures, no, that's all. Yeah, yeah, that's all.
Can you say something about this Susan Sontag actually and the uh, her uh, um, uh, maxima about the fact how the picture could how do you, should you take a picture of the conflict or something? Because um. it was a really nice thing for us. Yes, uh, I mean, first, thanks for, for, <laughs> for the presentation. Um, yeah, maybe really, um, it's a bit now uh, like kind of late, but... Just a few words, it's yeah. nice, uh, um, like... Uh, we, we've seen a, a lot of more photography now, and um, I don't know, did somebody read, really like, I don't know how in English, like the, the pain of others, maybe, can be? Uh, the book of Susan Sontag? No. Um, so she actually describes about uh, picturing people suffering, um, of like uh, war or, or, or dying people. And she wrote a whole book about um, how to present or reflect and how to present people who, who die. And um, So, but actually, um, she wrote about how to be uh, presented as a, um, like bodies, and actually the fact that, uh, like summarizing it very uh, briefly, um, that it doesn't make, uh, that it should make sense actually to present the people. So there would be kinds of consequences. For example, like the going direction of stopping the war, stopping the conflict, like something like this. And, uh, and the Leibowitz, which was actually also a like, photographer, maybe you know, uh, uh, also an advertising photographer, actually published a book after the death of Susan Sontag. And the very uh, interesting thing is that Susan Sontag appeared in this book, uh, actually in the whole process of having chemotherapy and was dying and you know, cancer. And then the Leibowitz and Susan Sontag together actually were a couple. So this super intimate pictures look fine the way uh, in this autobiographical book of Anne Leibowitz showing her works like advertising works, uh, documentary works of her father, but like between like George Friedel and uh, uh, Brad Pitt and like all this other kinds of thing, like actually her like that. So yeah, I think the interesting fact also about this thing is uh, about the person actually writing a book about how to present or reflecting, presenting dead people as well, the suffering people, and then being actually displayed in a book totally depersonalized of everything she wrote. But then you able to scan into those pictures and eliminate the cancer at the same time. Yeah, I think it was more like a yeah, but I mean, like, it is kind of a nice gesture to show, it's not like contrary, but sort of. Because, you know? mm -hmm. I mean, it raises a question for me, but how you should do the picture when you describe a difficult topic. I never had, have an answer, but I try to look like beyond the, the obvious. When we think about Moldova, like, which is what the thing that pisses me off all the time, the leads, of the foreign uh, press about the poorest country in the world. Now it's much more like a gentrified, the least visited country of Europe because Ukraine took the place of the, the most improved country. Like, why would you use those kind of stereotypes and why wouldn't you go like, further away? And of course, like, <coughs> it's all about the mass media and so on, but like, we kind of we are raised up with all this mass media, mass media thinking, this quick thinking, and with everything else, which is really fast. And like, 
at some point we need to stop and think and go and see beyond the image and try to uh, see what is after that. If you like investigate some kind of topic and you try to make a picture, pictures of some kind of issue, not necessarily issue, maybe you want to try to take a picture of your family or anything else. Like maybe you can see something else behind the person, what's happening behind him. Maybe you try to uh, regain your feeling through the picture or something else, but not necessarily to picture all this, you know, the, I mean, I can take a picture of you right now without trying to understand you. What I will do, I will do the picture from different angles at all. That's all different. And if we will not try to understand each other, to feel each other, and get into the context, the only thing that we do is we will try to do the picture from a different perspective. Uh, uh, I mean, compositional perspectives. You know, mental, experiential, and so on. So, yeah. Maybe that's what I was pointing to. Because it's something that are we, we are used to, and it's kind of, we are uh, using the same pattern that people were using during, during the time before the internet, using photography for the same sites, like sending with kitten, kit, kit, kitty pictures, or making selfies, or anything else. Or the first pictures were actually the pictures of the things next to you, when you buy a new phone, the first picture you take. work or not? <laughs> so, like, the parts are kind of the same, but like the visual language is much more than just photography. I mean, just much more than just. Uh, I mean, I, I like the digitalization because it actually brings us a lot of new stuff and a lot of new understandings. But the fact that we. I don't think that photography is undervalued somehow because I think in this age we have much deeper understanding of what, what is visual. It's just that a lot of us already know how to use photography. You know? And whatever it will be, like a dick pic or a kitten pic or anything else. I mean, we use photography all the time as a visual communication. But like, how much do we pay attention to what we write? It's kind of the same, like how do we write the text? We can write something really insulting to someone without realizing it. The same way we can shoot someone and show it in another place and insult that person. Does somebody have a kind of any input or questions or insultings? <laughs> develop this eye to see uh, something beyond the image like you have to make exercises or just make uh, pictures pictures uh, I mean random photo and uh, see what of the uh, what works and what not. I think it can be any kind of way. I mean you can be like really investigating the topic and everything and measuring everything and then go and take some uh, pictures. For instance, like I started photography uh, by shooting a lot of bullshit things. And then that's because I had no formal education in photography. I had a like, German background and then I went to go with the photography. Mm -hmm. So at some point I found myself with a camera working with a newspaper. With a uh, young editor who didn't know uh, what to ask for. And I didn't know what to do there. No. Mm -hmm. So I was just shooting a lot and then kind of working with what I did, trying to understand what's happening. You know? And besides the fact that I was choosing something for the newspaper, try to like, see like, what actually interests me, what was there. Mm -hmm. you know? Try like, going through that all the times and trying to be more critical of what you see. Actually. I mean, it, it, but you, you're also the 
think of uh, yeah, the viewer, right? What of the viewer? How? Like how, how to make a good uh, photo? Mm. Like, um, is it a question about photo or about narrative which you want to say? Yeah. So it's a little bit different, mm. different things. For example, Ramin's uh, talk about the art form and then you have to show the uh, song. Yeah, the combination. Combination. Which is like more of a, 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 a series of messages. Yeah. But if you just want for the another thing. Yeah. I mean, but uh, there are examples of the like, one piece of uh, art which is represented through one photo. And that is also okay. Oh, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> really popular. Yeah. But uh, it's more about your feeling. How you know, do you feel? I mean, it's, it should. For me, I, I cannot like say something universal. You know, because each person has its own truth. That's a, I think it's really subjective. It's all about your feelings and your position of things. Feeling people, ideas, buildings, everything else. Like how do you position yourself? And if your position here, this photograph represents your position here. And, uh, time, space, and everything. You know? It's more like, I, I mean, I, I really wouldn't like to say like um, how to say uh, some rules uh, yeah to do that because it doesn't exist because I mean like uh, Steve McCurry I, I showed him not just because I want to show the guy sucks but because of the fact that he went through the Immensive uh, quantity of the photo workshops, teaching for the journalists. At the end, when he was, uh, his pictures were found in the Photoshop, he said, Okay, I'm not a photo journalist, I'm a digital. Because there will be a lot of teachers that at some point you will see that they're input. It was a very inspiring to see all these works and uh, in the same way uh, for me it's hard like to make photos of people and like uh, how much uh, you I mean it's hard to came in a place and make pictures of people around you and like going uh, into their uh, spaces like I hate to take pictures of people. And how, how do you do this? I, sometimes I kind of don't see, I, I see it as a reflection of myself, you know, working also on myself, you know. Sometimes it's just a thing that I try to do, just an exercise. Sometimes it's a thing that I just want to experience. When I work with the, uh, for instance, with the people that suffer from the epidemiosis to loss, the butterfly disease, I actually went there to not be scared and not to have that disgust reaction that I had the first time I saw it. Because I'm honest about it, when I saw it, I scared. I can't look at it. And I was like, oh, if I look at that like this and have this kind of reaction, so it means that a lot of people have the same. You know? And I wanted to familiarize myself with the people that look different. Maybe have some kind of issues, but with the normal conditions and with normal care, they can live a uh, decent life. So I started looking at them just to get rid of that. And then I, just, I didn't want to just overuse it, and I proposed them maybe you can use the photograph that I do just for the sake of your promotion, promotion of the uh, organization and to raise more money. But it wasn't like something that I wanted. Mm, by the way, it's nice. It's nice way to discover the world around by taking pictures because uh, and discover other people. 
because we have like this block to not uh, look at other people. For example, if a kid watching someone in trolley boss, the mom say, oh, do not look, or it's uncomfortable to see uh, to look too much. For example, at people who have some disabilities or yeah. something that uh, uh, can intimidate. Mm. And uh, in this way, taking photographies, you can, I think that you can go like deeper into yeah. this. Uh, but it's not necessary to be like a, a, like a reporter style or something, because I was doing that kind of stuff. Because um, uh, we had one thing, I want to be close to the to UGM visual education, actually just and at the same time, we want to take pictures for them to for their organization. But like we had an argument with my colleague from China about when I show those pictures. He said, but here, but you don't show the people what are inside of them. And I like, I was, in, I am agreeing with her because he, she actually presented that those days another project uh, from the mental facility showing, uh, photographing the uh, people with the mental disabilities from the mental facility and projecting with the beginner their words, their drawings, their inner worlds, how they see the world. We're just taking that those pictures, which is showing much more things than, because she showed the picture that she did before. People with just like with the distorted faces and everything, you can imagine them, you know, pictures from the mental facility in, uh, in China during the early years. It's not a plastic to see. But when you look at it, why do you look at it? I mean, you look at that. Yeah, okay. I mean, cool. But then what is, uh, what is interesting about she said is that it is a cultural, it's a cultural approach that is, um, how do you say, uh, recognized as a, as a cultural habit. You know, like you take pictures of something. Something that you can do some things because you want to take pictures. Yeah, yeah. So why do you take pictures? Of what and what? You want to follow me. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, it's interesting. I, I thought about also like doing a an event and doing a project like like you do for example you go on holidays. No? But you go on holidays like you pack your things, put them in into a suitcase or, or a backpack, you close your door and then actually you're going to holiday. No? Kind of your project one day start. So you take a camera, you go outside, and you say, I'm going to return the pictures. Like, and you can explain the world that you're making the project with your camera, and people will understand it. You know? So it's a really, it's just something also, like it's very a nice place that the camera is a very nice tool just to look at things, just to interact with people, just to be um, there. And it's understood. understood. There's kind of people that don't understand, but it's a kind of a, in a cultural interaction. And it's also about the measuring. Like we use this word project, which is from uh, um, the English, which says everything. What's your project? Ah, I'm working on this project. And it's not only about the country, it's about the life. Yeah. It kind of brings you to the oversimplification of what you do. Because when I was starting, Because like, this uh, oversimplification, we need to have a project and we need to do something. Sometimes uh, it pushes people to do some really silly stuff, which is like with a lot of ethics and everything else. Just to rush for something, for the world best photo or like Sony or something else. Which is like industry. Yeah. If you want to feel something, you should be outside. At least to Feel yourself outside of the industry to have this privilege to be outside.
the presentation was saying that it's bad to kind of embellish things too much. But then journalistic photography still has to do that in a way. And it can't go without doing that. So it's important to still do it, but where where it kind of is the limit with it, I guess. I guess the limit is like if like, I would avoid thing such thing as a adventure like a journalism photography for the reportage. I would like to introduce an adventure You know? Because like there is like um, the I actually didn't introduce it. There is an uh, image that actually started the career process. There was a specific process in the uh, United States that actually scanned all the Cuba with the YouTube. With there was a specific force, the photographers on the on the, on the plane, and they were like, photographing. And that photograph actually showed proof that there are uh, the missiles. They had uh, they didn't need to show it to someone. It was used as an evidence, as a proof. Or the Oswald uh, picture that was used as an evidence that he was the killer of the uh, cannon with the rifle that was actually the rifle that he was killed from. Which was uh, also used as like, they were saying like, it's a fake, it's a fake, it's a fake, it's a fake. But it wasn't a fake. But it was proved that it wasn't a fake. It was proved the 3D model. But like, maybe the potential photography makes much more sense because when you try to say that the photojournalism represents things objectively, it's a, it's a toss of bullshit because at the time when you arrive at a specific time, specific time, it's all in object, you arrive at a specific time because of the agenda of the press, yeah? and because of the assignment, you arrive there, then you decide to turn your camera towards something, so you turn towards something to you frame it. It's not an objective thing at all. Yeah. It can be objective if uh, there is another observer who do it differently and who documents how do you do that. And maybe uh, another observer will show it. That's the picture with the Fabiana show. Uh -huh. There was another observer who showed that they were not objective. Yeah, yeah I think. Sorry, you want to. No, I just want to do the same, but like even, I guess, asking your subject to kind of turn in a certain light, you can say that it's already not objective because you're only trying to look for a way to control the thing. I said everything is subjective. And the, like, there's, there's a difference with, between the dynamics and the trans... Please look at the dynamics pictures and the non of the trans community. Because dynamics actually... She had a point. Because in the 50s and 60s, there was a completely other view of the transgender community. Because there was other understanding. And the 20 years actually switched it a bit. But she never tried to get into the minds of the people to understand what it is. She always depicted them from far. Nevertheless, she was kind of a lot of time together with them. But she had her point, which she tried to show. Without understanding the uh, societal construct that were those people are She was like kind of manipulating the fact that why those people who uh, promote gender are gender actually show themselves as like two feminine characters. Without pointing out that the society has a this And they want to think it's a really complex thing, but she decided to do that. And I'm building it up just because she was concerned. And I wouldn't say she was objective, she wasn't objective. Because if I'm from, uh, from Rybica, yeah, I'm from Rybica, uh, 16 years ago, I was homophobic and I would look different than this you know? And it will be my subjectivity, and I can say that I'm objective because. I come from a community which this kind of opinion of subject. I mean, the, the thing is, that I would say that uh, I mean, it's uh, really evident that there cannot be any objectivity, like the discussion about the real, a real world, uh, like or coping or having something to do with the real world. 
if like in every head of us now is a different reality and perspective of what we see now so how can there be like this kind of real world representing in a 2D frame but I was uh, but I think like the thing is that it's exactly about this uh, maybe self-reflecting or, or showing part of uh, of the process yeah. in our media culture we have like pictures uh, words to it but there's not a making of yeah. so I mean it could be in other media but usually the for example, newspapers, and also I would agree with you that it's very important to see like, which things are going on in the world, even like the heavy things, the, the wars, like everything. It's, it's very important like, to, to know it. But um, yeah, I would more like reclaim that the question of authorship, that I would like to believe an author, what he says, and, and that you can actually follow the way of subjectivity to know where he's come from, what kind of education he has. Uh, on which party is what is an opinion to somewhat and yeah and sometimes you can say you just kind of yeah stole this picture out of the hip or of the camera or I don't know and on the other hand you say no this is really like a kind of when I agree with somebody it's I think this part of authorship is kind of uh, yeah an idea to an idea but I mean even we are going towards it but like kind of in our days we have much more problems inside the authorship we have the preparations that you know, yeah, I, I mean it's a this is like it's a super different topic then you know yeah. like uh, yeah. about uh, about the punishment yeah. and yeah. about the whole machinery or industry as I said before. But still, I mean, if you read a novel, yeah, it's usually declared as a novel and not as journalism, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah uh, and and yeah. And then you discover the author or what you read and so on. Sometimes you go into the uh, proof of your novel, which you can find. And that brings you in another context. But when you believe you are an objective reality, you just fall. Yeah. The skinny boy and the eagle.
So you can see actually the traces of the other images. So it's kind of, and it's also about this uh, authorship issue that uh, sometimes uh, we, we can now, uh, we don't know who is the author in this image because you can see like a kind of, uh, when it's especially when the image is manipulated. So you can just uh, pick some fragments or data details from a picture and uh, like to have like a kind of draft <laughs> and make something else. So uh, yeah, it's a kind of another level of uh, understanding what is kind of the image itself. It's not a, it's not only about photography, but yeah, yeah. because uh, especially in the dig digital photography, it's like. Uh, it's like, it's not the photography that was uh, what, like 100 years ago, it's like you have it uh, fixed <laughs> and you can manipulate the, this kind of picture. So it's, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> and it's also, I mean, about the image, because the, the central subject of the paintings was the divinity, the God. Painter was serving some kind of yeah, like, no, like cult the the or church or like something, <coughs> or the um, the rich man, and he was painting him as a really horseshoe type of what they had. You know, and nowadays, like we can look at ourselves, we can do selfies, we can monitor ourselves all the time, we can publish. There are people who are publishing all the selfies all the time, like in Instagram, and it also says something about us, but maybe not the same thing as we write, as if we write it. So, yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting. I, I, I actually believe that art will disappear when the visual language will evolve as at least on the same level as writing is. Because it will evolve as it will not disappear, it will evolve to something else. Societies and narratives, whatever we then call art, whatever one uh, calls art. But this, uh, this uh, need of a narrative uh, is going to stay as long as human beings are human beings. <laughs> uh, the art will be called art and the artistic practice will be called artistic practice if everyone will be doing that. It will be just uh, the way of communication. Uh, yeah, that's my this is definitely like to perceive things in the different levels and I'll try to mediate on what's happening with you, mm -hmm. you know? and not just be exploited by someone to produce something. Yeah. Shall we go over to Placinta? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you.